Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash wiseguyradio. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. That's at www.audibletrial.com, A-U-D-I-B-L-E-T-R-I-A-L.com forward slash wiseguyradio. This is the Wise Guy Radio Show a podcast dedicated to educating and inspiring through conversations with today's top talents in the world of glass. We will be dissecting their journeys in hopes to deliver actionable content that you, the artist, can start implementing now, helping you grow not only as a creative spirit, but also a successful artistic entrepreneur. With a little organization, relationship building, and your artistic ability, you can obtain greatness. Climb aboard, whether an artist, retail owner, or enthusiast, we have a ton of fun in store for you. Welcome to the Wise Guy Radio Show. Three and a two and a one. Hey, what's going on, all you beautiful people? Welcome to the Wise Guy Radio Show, episode number 44. This is Jim Michael, your host, and thank you so much for tuning in today. It's a beautiful Monday here in Florida. Fall has finally arrived. And I could not be more excited because I won't be sweating that much this week. Uh, all you folks out there in the north and whatever that's got some even cooler temperatures, uh, enjoy all that madness. Uh, at least you guys get some leaf changing and stuff. And uh, all you other folks all around the world and your situations and your weather, I hope you guys are enjoying that and being safe. Uh, we've got some hurricanes out there, or did, and uh, some crazy storms and all kind of fun stuff going on. So... That being said, hope everybody is having a safe week and month, and now that we're in October, I can't believe it, it's already October, um, then this is also uh, episode 44, which is pretty crazy, so thank you again guys for tuning in. Uh, this week is going to be back on schedule. Uh, I'm feeling a little bit more in my head like I am back on schedule as well. I uh, just did like a three-day marathon, 36 hours of uh, blowing glass over at Disney to cover some shifts. And I'll be sporadically going over there a couple days a week for the next couple of weeks here. Uh, so I'm going to be getting these shows pumped out and on time for you guys. Uh, I have a bunch of good interviews lined up uh, with some artists and also some companies, including uh, Green Flash Glass, who is our newest sponsor for the show, which I'm super pumped about that as well. We'll be having those guys on soon uh, to discuss their product and their company and their background and their glass life and what have you. So uh, enjoy this episode. It's a full, uh, unedited version of my conversation with Chip, uh, a.k.a. Shipwreck. So again, this Wednesday, uh, I'm going to be getting into some discussions about consistency in uh, quality of life and also in your work as well and why it's so important to have a consistent product. Uh, whether you have 10 items that you create or 20 items that you create, that as long as they're all consistent uh, across the board uh, individually, you know, if you have item A, item A is always consistent, item B is always consistent, blah, 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 you know, kind of going down the board. So you guys take care. I love you guys. Thank you so much for your support. Have a beautiful day. And Ep Joy, episode number 44. It is our best of part three. Uh, actually, I shouldn't say part three. It's the best of show number three, or I'll just say the best of show, but it features Chip Steeler, a.k.a. Shipwreck Glass. Y'all take care. Peace. How you doing, dude? Doing great, doing great. Thank you. Yeah, no problem, man. So you're hanging out in Oregon, which is now a free and legal state. So congratulations to everybody in Oregon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man, pretty cool, dude. I'm yep. down, you know, being down here in Florida with the uh, the old fart system that we still have. Hopefully, here in the next two years, we'll be changing yeah. our stuff as well. Well, it all tastes the same. It's just a little bit, a little bit of freedom sprinkled on top. <laughs> Not quite looking over your shoulder. Same as it did the day before the legalization. Yeah, exactly. That's what I've always said too, man. It's just it isn't going to change the way I live my life. It'll just I can breathe a little easier. That's so, exactly what it does. Hell yeah. So uh, yeah, man. So last weekend was uh, DFO, right? DFO seven. It was the weekend before last. Oh, yeah, that was a yeah really, two weeks ago. Really great DFO, actually. Hell yeah, man. So uh, what what was the crowd like, like in terms of the the turnout for that? The turnout was, I think it was about the same as last year, but they have a bit more space, and the space that they have is better organized now. So the flow was really nice as far as, like, crowds. Um, the demo artists all just had a lot of space, and it wasn't, 
it wasn't so much like in years past, there's been a lot of crowding and hard to really see what's happening. And this year it seemed like it just, everybody had a lot more elbow room, but the crowd number was around the same as before. So it made it much more pleasant to be there, you know, yeah, yeah. not that it wasn't pleasant before. It's just, you know, when you've got a little, you know, little airspace elbow room makes it a little bit more relaxed. Yeah, man, because I know, like, myself, like, I, when I get into the larger venue crowd type stuff, you know, I get a little anxious at times, but I think that, exactly. you know, but then when you get into that type of, even though it's a large crowd, but just the environment and the community, I mean, it's 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 amazing to see the turnout in the community now to come out and support what it is that we've right. all been working for. And if know? I'm going to be stuck in a crowd, I mean, I couldn't think of a better crowd to be stuck in with, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's so pretty it's, badass. It's all a bunch of glass blowers and collectors and shop owners, and nobody's there for business per se as much as they're there just to, you know, basically celebrate glass art and functional glass. It was, uh, it was an incredible experience. You know, because everybody there, nobody's... It's not like going to a trade show where... Everybody's hustling for something. It's just a low key, sit down, have a meal with somebody that you haven't, you know, you respect their art, but you haven't talked to in a long time. And they're there in person. So, you know, it's, it creates, you know, having stuff like the DFO makes everything else more fun. And, it, you know, for someone like me who's, you know, all about collaborating, you know, it's the best place I can go to meet more people to collaborate with. Yeah, man, that's good. Cool. Yeah, I saw too how yeah. you, you put your face on Instagram. You're like, hey, this is what I look like. Come find me. <laughs> so I think yep. it's pretty cool stuff, man. Because you know, through social media and and through Facebook, and you know, like you and I, we've known each other for a while now, talking and stuff. And you know, it's mm -hmm. you know, I'm sure once you and I actually meet in person, you know, it'll be like we've been talking forever. So I'm looking forward exactly, to, you know, exactly. I'm looking forward to that day for sure. So uh, to kind of backtrack a little bit, let's get into your history. So I was reading that you have a background uh, as an exhibition designer, and that was here in Florida, you are saying. So tell, tell us a little bit about that. Okay. Um, see, around 2003, I think, or four, I moved to Miami with my ex, and she was going to university in Miami. And I initially was just going to go there, and I'm also, I mean, I – my degree is in painting and printmaking, and I had, I'm had i represented by a gallery here in Portland, Mark Woolley, and um, had to, um, right away, I when I got to Florida, I needed to open up an art studio and um, get my next show ready. And so I was doing that, and I ended up meeting some people that worked at the Frost Art Museum in Miami, and I guess it's uh, West Miami, out at 107th, and um, they, I ended up going over there to help work on a um, exhibition, and within a, about a week and a half, they offered me the position of exhibition designer, and I got to design, they opened a brand new museum, I got to design the inaugural exhibition for the front, you know, the new Frost Art Museum at the FIU, mm -hmm. um, and then they also had me... Um, touring with um, traveling exhibitions and designing in Central and South America and their museums for a show that we were um, we were traveling a, a photography Aiden Morel um, photographs and we took them down to Mexico City and Santiago, Sao Paulo and Buenos Aires and so we got to travel and design in their museums too which was pretty exciting. Yeah man that's awesome. But it was, you know, that was pretty much the culmination of um, working in museums and in the gallery museums and uh, art shipping, international art shipping for maybe 20 years, close to, yeah, 20, 21 years I had been in the business. And um, I collapsed my spine at work and um, had to have three discs taken out and basically no. Yeah, and, and, you know, nobody's going to let the guy who claps their spine carrying a piece of art, you know, handle their $3 million, $30 million painting. So um, basically kind of, you know, ended my career with that, with that accident. And so I moved back to Oregon. Hmm. That's, and, and that's where I got into glass. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm an Oregonian through and through. 
And so I, I moved back to Portland, and then within, you know, within six months, I was down in Eugene living with my brother Murr, and he, I was looking for a new career, and he, you know, he tried to teach me to blow glass, and I was getting the hang of it. But I was at the same time, I was really, really excited about electroforming these pipes. He had a small setup, which I quickly turned into a big setup, and then I. And then once that got going, I I ended up moving to a farm out in St. Helens, Oregon, outside of about 30 minutes out of Portland, and uh, really set up a big shop and where I had um, three big tanks rolling all the time, and you know, I just never really looked back. It's it's too great a career and too many you know nice people. It's definitely not as much money, but it's. My lifestyle and my enjoyment of what I do is probably better than it's ever been. Yeah, man, that's cool. Cause I, I like what you're saying because to me, you know, as a as an entrepreneur, um, you know, I could take my business, I could hire people to come on and do production for me, you know, have a huge studio, you know, be a, a bigger, large business. But, like, I'm looking at where the movement's going, including yourself and the th- as a third-party collaborative artist. You know, we're all able to be lifestyle entrepreneurs, not necessarily these multimillionaire, you know, you know, whatever, but we're able to be, you know, in a sense, a lifestyle entrepreneur. We can actually do what we want to do as our passion, make a living, yeah. survive, that, you know, save for the future, blah, blah, blah. That's that's you know. the dream right there. That's I mean, it's awesome. every artist's dream. Yeah. I mean, a little production on the side to keep the boat floating and a lot of like one-off collaborations where you're really dumping your passion into it, it creates, you know, a really nice lifestyle. It does. Yeah, it's awesome. Because, you know, like there's like yesterday, for instance, I'm out in the yard doing my wife and I are redoing our backyard and, you know, it's yeah. hot as shit outside and then we're moving rocks and stones and stuff. And I started feeling a little guilty because I've got orders that are pending right now and I wasn't working on my orders, knowing that I was going to be working on them today and also last night you know, during fireworks and stuff. Right. Yeah. You know, but it's, so it's kind of a funny yeah. it's a kind of a funny mix to like to 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 know that I can start my day off out in my yard and play with my dogs and the wife and kids and do yard work. And then at like eight o'clock at night is when I can actually start my work and I'll work until two or three in the morning. But it's like, you know, it's, it's having the ability to do that. But also for me personally, I'm trying to like not feel the guilt of not working. Yeah, that, that that. Is a, that's the flip side of working for yourself right there. What you just described is it's a 24 hour thing, seven days a week. You always have projects that are going on. And you have, it takes a lot of, it takes, takes me more discipline to give myself some time off than it does to make myself work. Cause I get, I'm sort of the opposite as far as time. I get like to wake up early and I go straight out to the shop. I mean, I just get my coffee, I take it right to the shop and continue whatever, you know, stage of projects I'm working on at the time. And, you know, and then I end up, you know, I can, it's easy to get caught up in spending the entire day, you know, just working. But you have to, you have to carve that out for yourself. And my girlfriend has, you know, weekends. And so, and I, you know, I don't really take weekends unless we're doing something and I'll just take the day off. Mm-hmm. But I don't have to ask anybody. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And my wife's the same way. She like she's a teacher, so during the school year she has the weekends off, or you know, and then all the holidays, whatever. But then summertime, it's like it's wide open. And for me, it's like even though it's summertime for me too, I can't just not do. I can't just not work. <laughs> you know? Exactly. You know? exactly. So it's, it's trying to find that balance of like, okay, honey, today I'm going to be just doing glass, and then maybe tonight we'll have some time, but tomorrow we'll have all day. You know, kind of thing. So it's exactly. You know, it's like it's scheduling out your schedule time. It out. Yeah, I just, just have to be, you know, diligent about that and not just, you know, because for a while when I was living on the farm, my girlfriend was living here in Portland. And um, so I didn't see her every single day. So I just, you know, do nothing but, you know, my farm chores, take care of the chickens and water the veggies and work. <laughs> and that's, that was pretty much my life for three years. And then I moved back now. She's in with me and we got a beautiful house in Portland and, you know, now it's all about scheduling and you know, forcing myself to take these time, you know, time off when I, you know, and it creates it's something you just have to do. You, you end up, I don't want to burn out. 
Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So do, when you guys, when you're doing your scheduling, do you guys like sit down and say, here's like the week ahead. Here's like what days I'm working, what I'm not, where we're doing this. Uh, just usually as the weekend's approaching, we sort of, you know, have a little powwow about, you know, what she's got going on her days off. Cause she, you know, she works long days during the week. She works 10 hour days. So, um, when she's got, you know, she has things she wants to go by or, you know, things she needs to get done on her days off. So we just try and, you know, schedule it all out together and carve as many blocks of time as we can, you know, yeah. where we get to go just do stuff that's not work related and just fun related. Heck yeah. That's it's awesome. Fun. So to, also yeah. to kind of get back into your, uh, your schooling that you had with the, uh, the printing and stuff. Um, you know, I saw it with the intaglio printing. I've always been in, in, intrigued by by any kind of print. You know, whether it was on copper plate or stone. You know, even stuff right. that was dating back to the Egyptians and even like you know cave paintings and exactly. stuff. You know, it's 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 amazing. So knowing that you have that schooling and then to see now where you are with your electroforming and the copper plating stuff. I mean, dude, like it took, it, it's becoming more painterly and more. I'm I'm actually it, you know I'm almost six years in doing this electric farming. And it's this uh this winter it'll be six years. And I'm just now getting to the point where I feel like it's really becoming painterly and I'm should, you know, in a, doing, using expression on the copper, I started etching copper mm-hmm. and um, and treating them like you would a printing plate. And exactly like you're etching a copper plate for entire printing. And I always thought that the plates look fuller than the actual print yeah, themselves. I agree. It's like a kind of object, and something about the color of copper is uh, so warm, and it just feels good. And it also sort of tends, since it's kind of an antiquated um, printing method, and and just copper in general it just has sort of an antique vibe to it. So that's that's then that gets right into picking the glass artists that I work with as well. Mm-hmm. Is uh, where you you know the copper, like say Phil, Mike Philpot for example, his the the shapes that he turns on the lathe sort of harken back to some like 1920s you know vase designs and and shapes just informing aesthetics. There's uh, like an antique. Um, element there that the copper is you know it's it's like they're made to be electroformed already he never thought of that until we started working together but those pieces look phenomenal with copper on them yeah. and yeah. it's and it's not and his work is all about the form which doesn't really change as much i mean it, except for when he's doing collaborations with other glass artists most of the time he works in clear colors Mm-hmm. And so it's not like I need to worry about covering up his wig wag or some sort of radicello pattern with the copper and having to compete with that for, you know, space on the piece. And the only thing to worry about is, you know, make sure you can still see the function and then add the copper in there with the trimmings and it just creates a really elegant, uh, one of a kind piece. Yeah, I agree. With Phil Potts' work too, and, you know, he has that that uh, uh, old Depression era style, you know, and work in his glass. Yeah. You know, like I know when you and I first started talking, I was kind of at the, that time of my life. I was influenced from the Depression era, and not only the shapes and styles of the glass, but also like the concept of function. Not even necessarily like the function of using it, but like of it sitting on your shelf and you have an appreciation for it and it putting a smile on your face. That the function that it serves, you know. But right. but when you add your your copper to the glass, it accentuates the shape and design and, and almost magnifies what's going on. And then, like, you'll leave a window, yeah. like you're saying, so you can see the function. Or if someone has a reversal yeah. there, you know, that kind of stuff. It, I can use it to, like, it's actually highlight some of those sculptural design elements that the glass artist uses, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it it's can, like... It can, go on. Sorry. Oh, I was just saying that it can accentuate or highlight the same thing and just bring it bring his idea further forward and and it kind of makes a uh, a really nice piece and then when it's a production item for him as far as his uh 
you know, these these are the Philpot line. There's like six models, and they're all, you know, similar shapes and different, um, slightly different functions, and all different sizes. You know, six different sizes. Mm -hmm. And um, but once they've been electroformed, they become one of a kind because I, I really don't repeat patterns very. You know, if I ever have repeated the same thing, it's been by accident and like years apart. But I try and uh, I try and you know just do what the piece sort of calls for and never try and you know mimic what I did last time. Right. I mean, I'll do that on production, you know, hands, dry spoons and stuff like that, where there's only so many ways you can do it. And I've done thousands of these parts at this point of the production spoons, but I'll do those the same. But those, that's like a meditation at this point. You know, I don't even, I doing orders for spoons and stuff. It's kind of, I don't think too much about it. I'm thinking more about, because I've done so many. Yeah. That I'm not, I'm not thinking about them individually very much, which makes me want to stop doing them, honestly. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm getting close to the day where I can just focus on heading. So I think for the rest of this summer, um, I, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I've got two, um, production orders that I'm filling right now. And, um, after that, I don't, I'm not going to take any more production orders probably until it's fall and just strictly work. I've been doing work with the mothership and I've got some collabs lined up with uh hopefully Cowboy, Jared DeLong and Joshua Oppendocker. Nice. And um I kinda wanna and and well I'll still do production forming for Liberty Glass. That's something that I'll never give up because that company and Shipwreck seems to work extremely well together. They're here in Portland, and you know, I just couldn't, I couldn't quit that. Yeah, no, I love the guy the work you guys are doing out of there for sure. Especially, the, especially the the sand deep, yeah, deep carved sandblasting and uh, electric forming are kind of made for each other. It seems like. Yeah, I agree. I There's agree. Nothing, it brings out the best in everything. Heck yeah! So, how long does an average piece take you? I mean, I know I know there's variations, obviously, in the size and the shapes and stuff. But is there like a well, so a, a production run for say spoons is probably going to take you know a couple weeks, considering that there's multiple things going on in the bath at the same time, and then you know there's all this. I mean, that's not that's not all just putting the copper on, but then you know it's, it's getting the where the copper is going to go, paint it onto the pipe, throwing the copper. Then after that, it's I do a lot of finish work, and I think that's something that might be one of the things that's helped me sort of stand out from other electroformers is that I do a lot of um, machine work with the copper after it's on the pipe, and play with the texture, and then get to the patinas. And so it adds a more finished, um, it creates a more finished product and it's not as organic as it comes out right out of the bath. So it tends, if you leave a piece in the bath for a while, it tends to start growing. It's almost like a tree bark, you know, it's mm -hmm. got a texture to it. And I try and I, I grind, I use a belt sanders, I <laughs> use Dremel tools, um, rotary, all sorts of rotary tools. Um, sand the copper down. I did some pieces for Mothership recently that, you know, I sanded them down to, you know, 5,000 grit and then polished them. And then went through with the buffer and polished them up. So they're like a mirror, you know. I did the same thing I did with those uh, ham pieces way back when, like five years ago. When I did that run of tall ham tubes. Yeah, I love that look. I like the, I like the look, too, when you're using and you're, uh, you're leaving like that, that kind of blue finish to it as well. Like that right. heavy, heavy patina? Yeah. yeah, the heavy patinas, um, patina work is a lot of fun. And I'm starting to get into using multiple patinas at the same time. And so you can do grow the blue where you want it and then lock it down with the lacquer and then go, get into other colors like blues and greens and blacks and browns. And I've got a silver patina that's... Um, 
I wouldn't call it, it's technically they call it silver plating, but it's not an electrochemical, it's more of a static bond, and it puts a several atoms thick layer of pure silver onto the copper. Wow. And it's about, it's about as durable as a regular patina. So, again, it needs to be lacquered down or eventually it'll wear away. Right. But it, it adds another color to that palette of patina that really becomes dynamic. Huh, that's so fascinating. Having, it's, it's like having a white, you know, on a palette, a, a painter's palette. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, if you only have dark colors and then all of a sudden you're given a white, it, like, a, opens a million doors. Man, that's too cool. Yeah, because, like... Besides the art itself of what you're doing, I love the science involved. Like, I've always been intrigued by different chemical reactions and, you know, even growing crystals oh, as a yeah. kid. You know, like, I know I've, I've gone to, like, the local craft store and just bought some, you know, generic uh, science kits for my kids, and we'll grow crystals and, you know, and, and watch chemical reactions, oh, yeah, you know, and alchemy. It's, it is. It's so neat. So to see that then transition and translate into what we're doing in the glass, it's, it's so fucking cool, dude. Like... I can talk to you for three or four days about this shit, <laughs> you know, just because yeah. it's, it's so exciting. I love it. I love, so I said, it's also why I wanted to bring you on just because it's your perspective on, on what you're doing is completely different from blowing glass and having to anneal glass and work with colors, you know, because I know you have a glass background, but your main background is exactly what it is you're doing right now all across the board. It's cool to see, like, your, your past – and you take in all the little things and all the knowledge that you've learned over the past 25 years, and now you've it's all culminated into this amazing art form that you now have. That, yeah. You know, I see your work, and I'm like, damn, that's some badass shipwreck glass right there. I mean, it's like, you know. Thank you. Yeah, dude, I no think, problem. I think that's what we're all really doing now. I mean, it's like taking what our interests are and what we've had, what turned us on in the past and trying to bring a little bit of that yourself, you know, what, what lights your fire, bringing that to the table while you're making art and I, you know I, on some level glass artists are doing the exact same thing as you know it's just mine might be a little bit more apparent because it's uh, well because there's the direct history to printmaking and you know I'm not really sure but it feels like everybody in their creative nature stems from the same place yeah I agree yeah that's like and I, and I, I find that as a glass artist and those that watch what we do, we're all drawn to the fire. You know, it's always been like for centuries and centuries right. and centuries. Ceremonially, we've all come around a, a fire or a flame of some sort and, you know, and, and come exactly. together as a community. And it's, it's cool to see a form of art being created from the fire that we as a community have a, this a spiritual, you know, connection to. And also right. ceremonially, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it, and it goes back, you know, thousands of years. I mean, it's, you know, even when you go back to like, you know, the electro, you know, plating, even though they weren't doing it the same way you're doing it, but like, you know, all the gold and stuff they used to do for the sarcophaguses and stuff and over in Egypt. I mean, it's like you, the metal use has been in art for, you know, centuries and centuries and centuries. But even the Egyptians were creating cobalt glass then that they were using for adornments and stuff. So now, you know, fast forward 2000 years, you know, or whatever it's been to see it done in yeah. a modern form. It's fucking it's amazing. Well, fire is, I mean, think about it. I mean, everything from a candle on a table to what you're cooking your meal with, there's something that relaxes people about having a fire present. Mm-hmm. And and it, and it gets you into a zone of, uh, you know, better thinking. It's just having a, pre- having a fire present does that. I mean, historically, I mean, it's, it's what you cook your food on, it's, you know, what you make your art with. It's how you, you know, make things. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. How you destroy things. Yeah. And fire is, fire is in everything, all the way back to the earliest human history. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty amazing, man. It's cool. It's it's a ton of fun. So, uh, your name Shipwreck, where does that stem from? What's, and what's influenced that? Well, that was, um, I mean, it's, it's pretty simple. When I, um, I was trying to think of a name for the company, and you know, as we talked about earlier, like, but, but just prior to me starting this company, um, I had lost a 20 year career because of an injury, and I was I had to teach myself to walk again. Mm. 
doctors, I mean, there wasn't even any guarantee after my surgery that I was going to be able to use my left leg or, you know, giving me pamphlets for prosthetics and stuff. And um, I just been too stubborn to lose a leg, I guess. <laughs> and um, made myself learn to walk again. And there's some nerves back in my hip that were severely damaged. And so, and then at the same time, just before I moved back to Oregon, at the same time, I got a divorce to, you know, top it all off. It's like the perfect trifecta of bad things happening to me. Right. It's like, you know, divorce, lose your career, lose your health, and what's left. Yeah. And so, basically, I felt shipwrecked. <laughs> mm. Hell yeah. I was, I was completely shipwrecked. And, you know, that's when I went down to Eugene and there pretty much must be a salvage operation since you got, you got me floating again. Man, that's interesting. It makes total sense, though. And, it, and that trip to Eugene, it wasn't just Mars, me. I mean, I, I have to say, like, Ham Breslin um, gave me an incredible leg up. Like, getting to Electroform, some of this stuff, like, right after I'd been, you know, I would only recently learned Electroforming. And here's one of the top glass blowers in the country or world, for that matter, mm -hmm. is giving me these incredible pieces to you know to do electric farming on and that i guess the caveat of having worked on a on the hand brushing piece this is all pre way pre waterworks i don't think waterworks is even a dream yet at that point and um but people i never had this sort of Start by like find, I want to like perform glass, so I better find some glass blower. It's like I got to start out with mer monkey pipes, um, hand brushing tubes, fill pot tubes, and then you know once you have worked with some um, you know bigger names in the industry, it became a lot easier for me to continue working with and being able to choose artists based on what the ultimate vision was at the end instead of just trying to recreate, you know, you know, reinvent the wheel or something each time. And so I ended up with, you know, I think it makes a big difference. It made a big difference. It made, it's a, it was incredibly fortunate. And I can't really talk about starting shipwreck without, you know, mentioning that I had a lot of help. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. You, know, you know, it sounds like, you know, being a mechanic that you worked on, you know, some Volkswagens for a couple of years, and then all of a sudden you start working with Ferraris and Lamborghinis. Right. You know, yeah. So. Or, you know, imagine, you know, if you're teaching yourself to blow glass and then you have to go to man for yourself. So imagine doing that in an isolated bubble or doing it, you know, in hand brush on shop. Right. Where you're like, hey. so just have the exposure that you get. And, uh, you know, you, you get tied on to a higher quality from the beginning. Yeah, I agree. It's like start, it's like starting out as a Ferrari. So yeah, man, it's, not having to work your way up to that. So yeah. it saved me a lot of time as far as like building the shipwreck machine, and it's like I I didn't have a hard time. And Ham even helped. Um, my the original production glass blowing was um, two of the pieces were his design that he gave me for my catalog, and he trained. Um, James Brown, local Eugene blower who now works for Waterworks, he trained him to make the pipes for me. Wow. So, so I mean, I the glass was all out of, you know, it's, Ham and I thought up what would be good and what kind of, you know, and, and back to the antique sort of forms and shapes, Maria's and, you know, bubbles and the shapes that you know, give it that old school look and um, not old school in the glass, but old school in like history of design mm -hmm. and uh, getting those kind of products to start off with, you know, really helped. And then when he actually took, he took chains back to work for Waterworks, which I don't blame him because he's a damn good glass blower. And uh, I had to hire a new, you know, somebody to do my production making the glass and it was incredible i put out a note for like on facebook like i'm looking for and 
the response was amazing. Like some really great glass blowers <laughs> were getting in touch with me right away. Yeah, that's like awesome. that day. Wow. I mean, it, it, it was top, probably took four hours. And I found Merlin McKenzie in that dynamic form. He's been a glass for, you know, pushing 20 years. I mean, he's, he's, a, he's been a production guy his whole career and he has the ability to do just about anything he sees. I mean, the mechanics of blowing glass for him are like tying shoes. <laughs> and so I, when I sit down and talk about new forms and shapes, like, I need this and, and he's like, oh, you mean like this? Bam, bam, bam. And I said, yes, that's exactly okay. Next piece in the catalog. Hell yeah, it's too cool. You know? and, and so, you know, having, you know, getting to work with really awesome glass blowers has been a, an ultimate blessing. Like, shit, I could never, if I was just working on, you know, no name or some, you know, janky first year glass blowers glass, then I never would. Yeah, you know, part of the recipe for success is to have quality ingredients. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And you have a super strong foundation now because of that. Yeah. That's and cool. now, as far as the foundation goes, now that I've, I'm going to be doing a lot more work with Mothership as well. And that's now, you know, it's a string of, I just finished uh, 12. I've got, 13, I've got the 13th one in my shop right now that I'm getting ready to start. And then they're going to be feeding me glass through the year, That's and awesome. so it's kind of it's going to be it's an ongoing thing. So as long as they're you know doing well, and then there's always going to be more. Yeah, man, and it's, 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 it's fantastic. It's, yeah, that's it is because like the I think mothership in general has set like this high, 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 high standard for quality. For marketing, oh my God, for business, yeah. I mean, er- everything in our industry that you, you can take and put into a, a one category, or I mean, if, if it's possible, you know, they've really taken the whole concept of what it is to be yeah. a professional, an artist, a business, and also like almost like mad scientists too, you know, like some of the function sure. of these pieces are doing is just amazing. They're the smoothest designs, consistently smoothest designs that, I mean, of any company I know of, they... Their production models are, well, they, they're, their function is, you know, unrivaled. Yeah. I mean, there's other there's other great pieces, but, I mean, they are really, really great. I love Toros. I love, you know, a lot of the scientific styles and the functions, but it seems like um, the Mothership pieces have a flow, an air flow, as part of the function that is just... So smooth. Oh yeah, you know I, I I remember those guys were first coming around. Like you know when I was starting off doing glass, and they were building a name for mm-hmm. themselves. You know and just seeing the yeah, well, you know the stuff yeah, they were doing. Scott Duffy is is without a doubt one of the most talented glass blowers around. Yeah, to see where and, yeah, I know. yeah, and Jake Colito, man, and his color work is. I mean, all of his work, but the color work in particular is just so insanely good. But, yeah. yeah. And when I was down, I was just up there delivering the pizzas last week, and um, Rose Rhodes was a guest in the studio during the week. That I was there, and I got to... That's another insanely talented glass blower. It was a real honor to meet him, for one, and for two, just to sit there and watch him work. On those light, tiny little dots. Yeah, man. I think he he's hit uh, something that a lot of us like look for in all of our work is where you you end up in a moment of zen while you're working, and time and space is just it's just the, what you're doing. There's nothing. It's almost like you know, the world does not exist. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's amazing. Yeah, I know there's times where I get into a piece and it's like you get that tunnel vision and then all of a sudden you come out of it and you're like, oh my God, I'm, I'm actually in my studio. <laughs> you know? It's kind yeah, of an unnerving it's, situation. It's like four hours later. Yeah, exactly. The last conscious thought you had was four hours ago. Yeah, it's... Uh, it's pretty amazing. That's, I mean, that's, I think that's what everybody's looking for when they're um, trying to do art in general. I mean, that's where the real creative 
elements flow from. It's just that great. Yeah, man, that's awesome. So you mind if we get a little bit of talking about your brother? Oh, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I know, you know, like we've talked about in the past, you know, Murr was a, a big influence in my work coming up and just seeing his style and creativity, but also um, his movement in the community itself, you know, really. Pushed. Yeah, he was extremely dedicated to this community. Yeah, for sure. So those that don't really know who Murr is or about him, you want to uh, give us a little insight into him? Well, let's see. Um, well, he's my older brother, two years older than me, so. I don't know really where to start. We grew up together. <laughs> yeah. Back um, in 75. He's actually 70. He was born in 68 and I was born in 70. So cool. I've known him since 1970. <laughs> 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 um, he's my first friend. Um, and um, I guess he got in the glass. I can't remember. It was, it was in the late 90s, I think. Mid to late nineties, it was pre pipe dreams and all that. Right, and he he was blowing glass and learning and really excited about it. It was the first time I'd seen him ex- really excited about. Well, he he did he was pretty passionate about photography for a while. At one point, when he was going to University of Oregon, and um, he was a really talented photographer, darkroom specialist, like doing fancy tricks in the darkroom. And, um, but yeah, it's always, you know, the art world is really catty. Like outside of the glass art world, it's like a different art world, mm-hmm. like painting, painters and photographers and sculptors when they're showing in galleries, it's cutthroat and it's really, it's a real, um, there's some elements to it that aren't as pleasant as doing the same thing in the functional glass world. Mm-hmm. It's a much more open and welcoming market. And so when he got into it, he started um, you know, working with doing production. I think uh, he worked for Skyglass a little bit. And Eugene doing production, he also worked for um, this glass artist that since passed also. Um, her name was Magic. And she was a uh, you know, local spoons, you know, guys and stuff like that. And then he got into, um, you know, he, he started getting more and more into the prep work. There's this really, that's where his then was, I think, is creating that prep work to use in the, the chaos style that he became sort of more known for. Mm-hmm. Is, you know, whipping things around with different layers that weave in and out of each other and, is it create, creating space on the surface, if that makes sense? Oh yeah, that's like what, a depth, a yeah, depth to the pieces. Yeah, that that's that, a big part of his work that influenced me. The the layering, like yeah. not the marbling look to it necessarily, but like just like the, I mean, you could look at his work and just stare at it for three or four days, yeah. just looking at it, you know. Right, right, and um, and it had a you know it had a pretty good influence on other glass blowers. You know they you know. AK was work, started working the same, you know, style a little bit. Um, other glass blowers started taking on the chaos um, style, and you know, not many people stuck with it because it is so labor intensive in the prep end of it. Mm-hmm. But that's where he, that's where he really shined. You know, it's like he had a knack for, and and he got a lot of pleasure out of pulling those stringers and you know, wrapping that color around and. You know, he had a he he was he got really good at it, and he could do it for for days. You know, and just not get tired of doing that aspect. And then he, when he starts building a piece, it's almost you know like he has these incredible colors to work with because he's been making these all this prep work. Right. But then he also started. I can't remember what year it was, but he started moderating with the top glass and the melting pot site with Misha and um and he he really that's where I think he had a real profound effect on a lot of other glass ones. And this was while I was still, you know, I appreciated the glass, I liked looking at it, but at that time, back then, I was a museum designer and you know, I was 
it wasn't exactly like you know, the newest pipe wasn't the most exciting thing to me at that point in my life because I was, you know, I was paying attention to giant gallery walls and other, you know, I was, I was on another trip and, um, but, you know, so, so some of the specifics of, you know, exactly, but I'm not clear on what he was doing at the melting pot, but, um, I have heard over and over and over again about people that said they came to him, they had some sort of, you know, crisis or some issue that they needed to work out. And he would, he had a way of talking to people that would, you know, make them feel at ease and at home and, um, work through the problems and get people to be able to answer their own questions. That's something our dad was really good at as well. Nice. He's like, you come to him with some sort of problem and he'll find a way through the conversation to get you to find the answer that you're looking for without having to tell it to you. Huh. That's cool. Magic trick. I, I, yeah. I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> you could. I guess I didn't get that in the gene, gene pool. But, um, but so many people came up have come they, every year at DFO when I see them or at trade shows or just when I'm down visiting Eugene and I stop by the cornerstone uh, shops and say hi and people he's like, Oh, your brother was just such a positive influence on me during this career. I would never have stuck with it if it weren't for him and I hear a lot of that and it's, it really makes me feel good to keep hearing it because you know, when you hear that, you know, your brother's passed on, it's like made a lasting effect on a community that he loves so much. Yeah. And uh, that was another really nice thing about the DFO last week is that um, they dedicated the stage where all the music and everything happens is now the Mermonkey stage. Yeah, that's so awesome, bro. I saw that. And, and they, they had a really nice dedication. And um, yeah, that was, that was a real touching moment. Yeah, you know, that's, that's, you know, with our community, that's what I love, you know, like, yeah. you know, we don't all know each other personally, but we all do on some level. And the, the way the community comes, like when he passed, you know, it was like, it was amazing how fast the community came together, you know, from all over the world. It's true. You know? Yeah. I mean, when, after he passed, the, the auctions that went down to help his family, mm-hmm. Billy and Anna was mind blowing, like mind blowing. I mean, Team Japan did a piece for him. Um, Brushler, everybody, every every Clinton. I mean, all these glass blowers stepped up, made beautiful pieces, auctioned them, and just sent it directly to you know, their PayPal. Yeah. And it was, it was just such an incredible outpouring of support. And, you know, yeah, I think myself, yeah. it was one of the first auctions I had ever done before on Instagram. Like I, I, I do them now more often as like a regular thing, but like that, I think it was like the second one I had ever done, but I was like, as soon as I saw it had happened, I was like, Holy shit, I am all over this, you know? Right. So was, you know, and I think it was at the time too, at the, what I got for the, for the auction was honestly, uh, the highest amount of money I'd ever been paid for an individual single piece too. So, you know, it was right. the whole overall and experience was just amazing. Auctions are a really great way to, um, like if you've got something new that you, and you're not sure where it falls in the price category and auctions are a great way to sort of take, take the pieces temperature. Yeah. I you know, find out yep. how hot it is. Because you show it to people and you're like, this is for auction. It's like, you know, you can set a private reserve, you know, say, I want at least this much for it. Mm -hmm. And so the reserve may or may not get met. But then when it gets met and then tripled, you're like, whoa, okay. Now I did something really good here. And you know right away. Because sometimes you don't know when you're in the shop and you're alone. And you're like, you know, I'm just making these things and it's new. But... You know, I don't know what anybody's reaction is going to be. So you throw it on social media, and it's kind of like, you know, what is the instant reaction is a good way to gauge how popular and lasting this piece can be. Yeah. You know, as far as, like, a new form, a new shape, a new design that you want to, you know, incorporate into production maybe or 
maybe it's just something that you want to do one of them. It's so hard. You don't want to do that many of them. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree, bro. That's what I was talking about that a couple couple of shows back. Was uh, that's what I do a lot as well. You know, I, got, I usually start my auctions off at like what I'd wholesale it for, you know, and then just kind of go from yeah. there. But yeah. I like I like the idea of the reserve as well. It makes more sense. Yeah. Well, and you know, you see a lot of people where it's like they, there is a reserve, but they'll start it at like one penny, and then be like, well. Then the increments, of, and somebody will jump right away and mm-hmm. be like, you know, I, I haven't done this start at one penny thing yet, but I've seen like, like Clinton, he'll, he'll start at, he'll be like, reserve, and there's a reserve in place, bidding starts at whatever. And instantly somebody's like, oh, $400. Yeah, it's crazy, like, right? Opening bid, opening bid, $400. Yeah. And then it just goes up from there. I mean, you just watch it. One of those Kachina, those super beautiful sand uh Kachina pieces with all the stacked colors, and you, you watch it go from four hundred to like four thousand dollars yeah. in the course of a day on this auction. And it's like, you know, he, uh, if, you know, if that were my product and I had and something like that happened, I'd be like, yes, Kachina dolls. <laughs> <laughs> So, exactly. <laughs> maybe maybe that's my down payment on my next. <laughs> oh shit! But you know, know it, I mean, yeah, it, it, yeah. It, yeah, it's. I'm, I'm surprised on a daily <laughs> basis the amount of money being spent in the in the community now. But the fact that people are willing to spend the money is what is what I love. You know, yeah. it's like they're not afraid. It's, it's proven that it's. I mean, the glass market is not going away. No, it's. It's. They, I've heard people talking about a bubble and it's going to pop, and it's not. It's not a bubble, and it's not going to pop. It's an industry, and it's a creative industry, and it's just growing. Yep. It's not going to pop. There's no glass ceiling. It's the sky's the limit, and the sky's not even the limit. You know. Oh, there's, there's, there is. I don't believe in that. That there's a limit to any of it, and. You know, when you hear about pieces going for ten, twenty thousand dollars, it doesn't surprise me. In fact, it it makes me really happy. You know, to hear yeah. that somebody out there has found that, and I'm like looking at them and looking at what they're doing because they're obviously, you know, paintings go for twenty thousand dollars every day. Mm-hmm. You know, why is it glass? You know, there's no reason just because it, you can use it for something besides looking at. Uh, I mean. Paintings are functional art as well. It's just their function is to look good. Yeah, exactly. You know? yeah. It's like functional and functional glass both looks good and it's got a you know a practical purpose. And yeah. so there's no reason. And and a lot of people, you know, there's you know periphery industries to glass that you know are sort of self you know the the oil industry, for instance, you know with the the, the hash oil and stuff. And that is such a huge cash cow. People are getting incredibly wealthy mm-hmm. um, making this. And the medicine, I mean, I'm, you're not really in tech. Well, I guess you are in a, in a medical state, but you're not getting a car in Florida, right? Yeah, not yet. We, we have uh, Charlotte's Web is now available uh, for kids and people that have uh, seizures and epileptic issues. But the legalities right. for medical, yeah, we we lost it the vote by like it was like point two percent. We actually we had more people vote yes for medical marijuana on the last ballot than we had people vote in general for the governor race. <laughs> well, that doesn't surprise me because you haven't had any good governor candidates for a long no, time. Uh-uh. <laughs> um, Florida's got some really messed up politics. Yep. Um, but the. You know, the oil, I mean, the medical, because it, it's also brought out the testing industry where, you know, they're doing the analysis of the oils and you know exactly what's in there. And so for the first time, I mean, when I was growing up, nobody knew exactly what was in a brownie. Mm-hmm. You know, so sometimes maybe a brownie might be too much for you. Yep. Well, now it's labeled on the package how many milligrams of every element of the plant is in that brownie. And so you can actually know exactly what you're taking. There's no mystery anymore. And so for something where the high CBD strains and whatnot like that, that you can, you know, it's like going, you can medicate with it. 
without yeah. taking any risk or any chance of, oh, you know, taking too much, and then you end up having to take a nap or a two-hour walk or something, <laughs> you know? Exactly. But, but that's, I mean, that has just the fact that things are tested and knowable now, like we have these known elements that we didn't before has made an incredible market in the legal space, especially in the medical space. You know, and a lot of that is because of, I mean, I never heard of testing happening on the level that it's happening now before the oil was so popular. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. And, and the, you know, like, and then there's, the oil is, at first, you know, there's a lot of, you know, residual solvents and stuff in the way they used to be doing it. My friend Lou Swan runs uh, Sub-Zero Extractors, and he's so dedicated to having a product that takes all of the solvents out that, you know, most of the cannabis tests are run on his machines now because of that. And um, all the, you know, the oil competitions, uh, national and in Spain, and I think there's one in Somewhere else, there's some, another one outside of the country, maybe it was in Canada. There was one with his machines as well. And but all these industries, they're all these people are doing very well financially. And so, why wouldn't they want a twenty thousand dollar petty? Yeah, exactly. That's you what know, I, like, like, my family they're, talks they're, about that same thing. They're driving driving giant luxury trucks and Mercedes and BMWs. Why wouldn't they have you know other luxury goods? that are just as fancy. I mean, if you're going to buy a Rolex, might as well buy a mothership yeah, or exactly. a Clinton, Clinton one-off heady Pacino doll. Mm-hmm. I mean, why not? Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's pretty cool. Like, that's, that's, the, that's the American dream, right? It's like, make money, be supportive, have your future solid, and start enjoying things. And being able to enjoy things that cost a little bit more money because you worked so damn hard. Exactly. And you were smart about how you did it, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm sure if I ever get to a point where I'm making that much money, I'm going to be buying expensive, super expensive pieces. <laughs> <laughs> As for now, it's like, I just work on them. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, it's like uh, um, down in West Palm, uh, down at Habitat, you know, like they're having the shows down there now where they were there at one time, they were just a glass gallery where now they're they're all about you know having these pipe shows and you have the locals that live down there that you know the multi-billionaires that are that are buying these functional art pieces not even to use them just to stick them on their shelf because it's an amazing just the fact that it's a piece of a beautiful art but also the fact that yeah they're beautiful i mean like look at some some pieces you don't even know like some of cowboy pieces or say micah evans or Mm -hmm. buck it's like you don't know how they really function. They're functional yeah. somehow. Yeah, exactly. But, you, but the, really, the function is really taking a backseat to the sculptural, creative, visual element of, wow, that is a beautiful object of art. It's like, and you can also load it up in the evening and look at it. Yep. <laughs> but you wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily always know how it functions just by looking at it the first time, you know, you have to really inspect it. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, it's really what the striking part is that it is a piece of art, a piece of sculpture. And I don't see it, any reason that it doesn't fit into the same, you know, financial, you know, echelon as any other piece of art or sculpture. Yeah, absolutely. And, I agree. Yeah. You know, and that's, you know, that's so powerful. And so if they can, when they're reaching those markets and they're, more and more artists are doing it more and more often, and it's it's incredible. It's just an incredible thing. Yeah, and like you're saying too, like the, there's I don't see a bubble either. You know, like the whole concept is kind of silly because it seems like yeah, well, our well, industry think, is based on trends more than anything. Yeah, I think usually the people that talk about the bubble are also the ones that aren't as confident in their work that it would ever be worth that or something. They're like looking, they're like the naysayers and skies falling kind of people mm-hmm. instead of being the people that are like amazing opportunities are happening and, you know, jump on that, you know, vibe and, and roll with it and try and, you know, try and go there. 
and or just go there. Don't even try, just do it. Mm-hmm. And um, but some people, it's, there's a lot of. It's amazing. There's so many glass blowers in Oregon. I've met glass blowers that have been blowing for like six, seven years, and they're still selling like eight dollar spoons to the local shops. Like really? Like is that how you're gonna you get a four one k eight dollars at a time? Mm, exactly. <laughs> But, you know, that I don't know how they're going to survive doing that unless it's just a transitional job. But right. if you're really dedicated, you might as well, it behooves you to push the envelope constantly. Like, yeah. constantly right. Yeah, I agree. But I, I know, like, the first, you know, when I first started myself personally, it, was, it wasn't as easy as it is now. I'm not going to say it's easy, but it's more affluent out there now than what it was in our industry. So like, you know, I was, right. you know, I was doing bullshit production, you know, the $8 spoons, for instance, for probably the first, you know, eight, eight, nine years or so. I was still working. Yeah, well, that's where you get Right. Yeah, exactly. And, I, and I, But I, at the time, though, throughout the production, I was still taking a day or taking several hours and experimenting through the production, you know, just, just to kind of continue to grow as an artist because I had the business, yeah. but I also wanted to be an artist as well, you know, so it's, it's, it's such a huge opportunity now for the newer generation of glass artists coming up that can start off with a solid foundation of technique and then find their niche and their way in the industry and then make a killing as an artist, but not be a dick, not be overconfident or cocky about it, be a humble right, exactly. in their studio glass artist that's making a killer living. That is another, that is another, you just hit something right on the head that I think is really important is staying humble. Mm-hmm. Is nobody wants a braggart, you know, around. And, and also it's just being real. It's like, even if you had a great idea and it's the best idea in the world, would you have had that great idea if it weren't for having worked with or seen or being exposed to? whatever elements it was that brought you to that idea. It's like to always be having a little bit of respect and something for where you came from that I think people respond to and they can vibe that off. But I, I try really hard to stay humble. You know, it's, it's not too hard for me because, well, shit, my stuff's, you know, it might be good electric forming, but without the glass... <laughs> What am I electric for me? Right, right. You know? Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, I hear you. You know, but... It's like, I'm a secondary thing. I rely on on glass artists. Right. And their, you know, their ability to work with me. And, like, Liberty, I mean, it's like, Paul Long at Liberty Glass is, is, I couldn't, some of the pieces that we've done together are... Like, we have a, maybe is a synergy the right word, where we're both just on the same page. We know when he starts to describe something, I can visualize what he's talking about pretty easily. And he obviously does the same thing with me, because I can, I can do a drawing on my sketchbook at, you know, 10 at night, half buzz, and take a picture of it with my cell phone all the time. Only second point driving by. Um... <laughs> There's, uh, I can send him a picture on my cell phone like that I took with my sketchbook. And while he's doing the night shift, I'll get up in the morning and he'll have a picture of the piece finished. That's awesome. You know, that's just, we're, we're on the same page and we work really well together like that. And, um, yeah, I, I've got a lot of respect for, and, and I was, you know, getting to work with him was, I was just starting to work with Buddha a lot, mm-hmm. who founded Liberty, and um, he was uh, Buddha, Buddha had um, pretty bad ears. He didn't hear like he was partially deaf, and so a lot of a lot of the work that I ended up doing with Liberty was with Buddha through Paul. <laughs> Interesting, and that's how I got to know him. And so the communication was right off the bat. We knew what each other was talking about, and we were both coming at it from the same direction. You know, just not about more about just making cool shit. 
than trying to make a product that sells. They're just really like, let's make it. Cool. Wouldn't this be cool? You know, and then and then it's happening. <laughs> yeah, those are the best conversations too, bro. I love that shit. Wouldn't it be cool if? And then it's you make it come to life, and it's it's uh it's pretty neat when that happens. Yeah, and it's so much easier when you're in the same town too. You know, where you can just pop over to each other's studio and just like pass projects back and forth. Yeah, that's right. And I mean, I do I do a lot of work to be a male, and that it's okay working like that, but it's it's definitely slower everything's slowed down speaking of which um direct is i think he's starting to get work on that piece of yours for like two years ago <laughs> speaking of things taking a long time right i mean he That's i was hilarious. talking to him not long ago i think he's going to get to it right after the whole chalice food log goes down because nice. he's doing he's doing kind of like what murray did for the um for the DFO and uh, Maddie White does for the Champ last mm-hmm. game. He's like doing the artist or you know organization and you know making sure that all the artists have their stuff and play and um, are ready for the flame off. Hell yeah! And and so he and that's a that's a real big job. And I suppose I know um, the DFO was probably of those three. I'm thinking the DFO might be might have been the easiest one because it's a smaller event, but like Chalice and Chalice is huge this year. I yeah, mean, I saw man, holy shit! It's, it's I mean stadium style huge, and it's the biggest glass event or well, actually not even a glass event, it's a hash event. And glass is, almost seems like it's sitting second. Yeah, it's totally, to totally that. secondary. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, but. But at least it's got a place. But that flame off has got to be huge, and you know, I don't envy anybody that has those jobs. I just by witnessing Merge having the, it's like herding cats, you know, mm-hmm. being, being a, a cat cowboy, it's like trying to get all these artists to do the same thing on time. Yeah. Is, good luck. I mean, <laughs> good luck. I mean, I mean, all every artist that you say this to can totally relate and be like. Yeah, that'd be pretty hard managing 15, yep. 20, 30, 50 artists that are going to need all to have their this turned in by then and, you know, be have all their tools and everything ready to go at the beginning and blow it up. Yeah, dude, I can't, I can't imagine, bro, because, like, with this show alone, me being an artist and then trying to get other artists on, you know, to register for the time period, you know, and it's – it's been a fun game because I know that I'm dealing with artists. So like, and myself being an artist, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm patient with it. So I understand, yeah, you, you know, so it's, you it's, it's a you fun game. Enough that your expectations go up. Yeah. I can't be like, God damn it. What the fuck? Why can't you call me? You know, I know you're probably yeah, in the studio. I said 10 o'clock on <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Dude, like last week, you know, like my Google, my Google calendar said I was supposed to call you last Monday and I'm like, I'm a whole week off. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, uh, I'm glad because I'm glad because I was telling you when I got that message. I was like, Oh man, is that today? I went yeah. back to my schedule. Okay, it's next week. Yep. Yeah, I was tripping. <laughs> cool, dude. Well, uh, let me. I want to move forward a little bit. I got my battery on my recorder here is getting low. I have not been able to find a AC plug adapter for this stupid thing, so I can plug it in the wall. And uh, uh, we started with yeah. a full battery, dude. I've gone to Best Buy, freaking everywhere. I cannot find a stupid plug. I might have to go on Amazon and yeah. search. Radio Shack sells the ones that have the dial. That there's all the different voltages. Oh yeah, I have to look for that. I forgot about those. And, and then it's got it's got the you know the regular wall plug on one side that has a dial on it that regulates whatever voltage you're going to have. And then on the plug end, it usually comes with like you know five different sizes that are the most common sizes to plug into a appliance. Okay, cool. I, I have to look for those. So, I, I forgot those things existed. Yeah. Try Radio Shack. Hell yeah. Okay. Sweet, dude. Yeah. Well, uh, I have my lightning round set up, and it's it's more designed for glass artists, but I think it'd still be fun to uh, to talk to you and ask you the questions as well. So, okay. You know, I figured we'd just go ahead and do the lightning round with you anyways. So, cool. Uh, the lightning round consists of uh, a couple questions here, short questions, and I just need a quick 30 to 60 second answer. 
and then uh, okay. if they go longer than 60 seconds, it's okay. But no big deal. So uh, let's right. get the lightning round going here. All right. So if you could work with any living glass artist that you haven't worked with before, who is it and why? Um, I'm going to say right now I want to work with Jared DeLong really badly. Um, his glass art is phenomenal. His, um, his design elements are right up my alley as far as aesthetics that I like. Um, he's got techniques with cold working that are fascinating to me with the, um, where he creates like the texture of a snake skin mm-hmm. into the glass. And it's, it's like sand carving. We already know how much I love, you know, deep carved sand. And it's another element that adds texture to the glass that I can't see any way that copper and it together aren't going to be a match made in heaven. And, and and he's an incredibly cool guy. I met him uh, at Chance, no at uh, AGE, and um, been in touch with him ever since. And he's just a very uh, down to earth, smart, educated, deep thinking individual. Hell yeah! Awesome. If you could describe the sound of glass cracking in one word, what is it? I think that word is, oh. <laughs> oh, oh, man. <laughs> Your top five favorite yeah, colors. Five favorite colors. Um, glass colors, I, I'm going to uh, say I don't know the names of all of them, but I am a big fan of there's a very pale blue that's a transparent that looks like a sapphire. There's um, the dichro stuff that's coming out of like um, is it dichro dichro alchemy uh-huh. in Ashland with uh, turtle time and he weighs um, really cool elements and I've been seeing the sparkly glass um, coming around with the dichro flex in it. Um, you know the color I'm, you know, clear is pretty nice too. <laughs> you know, clear, no, no color. I, I do. I like clear. I, um, I like clear mixed with, you know, in commas and where, you know, there's clear sections in there and it, it adds a little light and, and um, visual lightness to a piece. I think that, I don't know if I have a favorite color though, but I am excited about a lot of the new stuff that's coming out. I'm not crazy about the, um, well, I don't have a black light in my house, so I don't see the point of having a black light reactive piece. Mm-hmm. But per- personally, I mean, it might be neat and the kids might love it, but I haven't had a black light in my house since I had a velvet Elvis poster in like 1989. <laughs> That's fucking cool, man. Hell yeah. So, uh, what's your worst injury you've ever experienced? Worst? Well, I broke my spine once, but. Yeah. Um, uh, and I've broken a lot of bones, but in the shop, um, in this industry, my worst injury has been just lacerations, yeah. cuts. Because cool. you get, get some of that electric forming fluid on the open wound, mm. that'll tell you that'll tell you what thing is all about. <laughs> I can't imagine, dude. Holy shit! So uh, you're not a glass artist per se, but if you can give your beginning artist self any advice, what would it be? Work fucking hard. Hell yeah. Always work hard. Don't take anything for granted. Hell yeah. Uh, if you were stranded, oh, this is the last one, so it's kind of a fun one. Um, I was going to try to think of like an island question. I wasn't too sure about it, but I was like, yeah, maybe I will. So uh, if you were stranded on an island that had a glass studio on it and only supplied gases and a kiln, and we'll say for in this instance, for you, there are, say, uh, two rigs in there waiting for you. What five items would you bring? Um, I would bring... One item would be an entire electric forming setup with a solar panel. Nice. Because, <laughs> uh, which I've, I may be getting, my shop may be going off the grid here soon if I can uh, get a panel and the battery set up. I think that it's all possible. Yeah, I don't use that much electricity. Um, I would 
would bring file sandpaper and a bottle of ammonia for patinas. Hell yeah. Cool. And I'd like to form stuff. If I had a glass studio and some pieces on hand, that's what I'd do for a shop. Like the most important shop items, I think that's really the question, yep. is the, the bath, the bath, the patinas, and uh, something to work the copper with. Nice. The files and paper. Heck yeah. yeah. So the last question for you, uh, is there any short parting piece of advice that you can give a newbie? Um, advice to give a newbie, I'd say uh, don't expect the world all at once. Um, constantly strive and constantly learn. Always be learning. A day without learning is might as well be, you know, a sick day. Yeah, exactly. That's the beauty with this industry, man. I learn something new every single day. It's learning is important. And being open-minded to learning and not, don't be rigid. Heck yeah. Be, you know, don't hold on to your own uh, assumptions and presumptions too tightly. Because somebody's going to prove you wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Love it, brother. So tell us how we can get a hold of you and find you out there in the world of cyberspace. Okay. Um, Instagram is Shipwreck Glass. And uh, Facebook is Chip Stealer. Facebook made me change my, uh, it can't be called Shipwreck, but I do have a fan page on Facebook as well called Shipwreck Glass. Um, but the best way to find me and direct to get a hold of me is Shipwreck Glass at Gmail or direct message on Instagram. Beautiful. Hell yeah, man. Well, again, as always, thank you so much for your time. You know, it's a, uh... I've known you for a while again, but it's it's always good to get to know you even better, brother. That's right. Thank you for including me in this project. This has been fun. Yeah, man. Yeah, it's exciting. I've got I've gotten amazing feedback from the community from doing this. Only having uh, you're number twelve right now for the shows, so it's uh, actually no, you're number thirteen. But that being said, yeah, it's uh, one of those kind of things that popped in my head one day, and I got an opportunity to start doing this and did it, and I'm like, I ain't turning back, dude. So oh, awesome, awesome. That's great. I mean. It's- good exposure you get to talk a lot about glass which i know you you love doing Mm -hmm. so um i can't see how it couldn't be fun and it's good for everybody else out there that wants to you know hear what somebody else is thinking about yeah exactly amen well you enjoy your 100 degree oregon weather for a couple more days hopefully it gets cooled down for you guys man shit all right you know get out the garden hose and pretend like it's raining here and <laughs> there you go dude i'm gonna go outside and jump in the rain myself it's pouring outside so good time for oh you. man just yeah we got some rain today all right homeboy yeah. we'll have safe times out right. there and uh i will be in touch okay take it easy let me know when things get uh edited down i'd love to hear it yeah yeah i'll definitely uh i'll send you a copy for sure and also, cool. I've been slowly working on that octopus rig that I've been telling you about for years. I, I'm at the very oh, end of it. So, yeah. um, cool. You know, so I'll be getting, you know, I'll let you know when I get it out. I just got to basically just got to finish the treasure chest and a couple little coins I'm going to throw in that bad boy. It's going to, the, the treasure chest itself is going to be a perk that's going to have coins in there. So when you're like smoking it, the coins will kind of rattle around inside the treasure chest. Oh, neat. Neat. So, yeah. That's going to be cool. Yeah, I'm stoked on it. Can't wait. Hell yeah, man. All right. Thanks again, brother. Okay, thanks. Have a great day. You too, buddy. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Peace. Thank you guys so much for listening to this episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show. If you have any questions, comments, or remarks, please leave them in the show notes page area where it says comments. We'll see you soon. Have a wise night.